Hello, barflies, and welcome back to RT Sidebar. On today's show, we have Kathy Fedor, who will be talking to us about building financial acumen, why every leader needs financial skills, and how to get them. This is RT Sidebar. Stay tuned. Welcome, welcome, welcome to RT Sidebar. As always, it is October, not Respiratory Care Week, Respiratory Care Month, because we're too awesome. We're too awesome for just a week. So thank you so much. We have Kathy Fedor on today. We're so excited. I'm here, as always, with the doctor, Dr. JB, Jonathan Butler, and our producer her of cats anna hayes it's so exciting to be here as always because this is the best part of my day and jonathan's laughing because she's like this guy is nuts <laughs> right you're thinking i'm nuts right no i don't think you're nuts i think you just got the best radio <laughs> voice in business in the business so you know that that that's how i do and <laughs> I, I also think i had like the best dancing skills you do like like, like that's what i'm going for so you know today we're talking about financial acumen and we have kathy fedor cleveland clinic children's she's uh she's a big member of the nbrc like she knows her stuff and i will tell you one thing that we are not good at when it comes to respiratory therapists is finances <laughs> we're just like yeah it's ventilators so, ah, we need all these things and, and it's expensive but like how do we manage it it's it, it, it's tough. So like, I'm super excited to have Kathy. Kathy Fedor was at PSRC, the big Pennsylvania, the awesome Pennsylvania recently. And it was so much fun. We had, and uh, Anna, we've talked to, uh, we've talked to uh, Kathy. We're just super excited, but like really financial acumen is a big deal. It's a big deal that we could get a little bit better. So Kathy, welcome to RT Cyborg. We're so excited to have you. Thank you. Awesome. So, uh, Kathy, give us a little background about you. Well, I've been a respiratory therapist for a really long time. And like many managers, I kind of started out as a frontline caregiver. And then I was promoted to a lead therapist. I was promoted to a supervisor. And then I became a manager. And what's unique about my situation is that when I became a manager, I was promoted to a manager of a department that didn't exist. So <laughs> that's, yeah, kind of unique. How does you have to explain that a little yeah. further? <laughs> so here at the Cleveland Clinic, you know, we're a children's hospital within a hospital, but mm -hmm. our children's hospital grew so exponentially that that department was just a subset of a, an adult department and we became our own department. So when I became the manager of the Children's Hospital, it was not formally a department. So I had no one to pass the baton on to me. So I had no mentor. I had nothing. And I just went from being a supervisor to being a manager of a department that didn't previously exist. So that was in of itself a challenge. Um, th th that sounds like fun. Yeah, yeah, that was a lot of fun. JP, that's like, uh, here you go. Yeah, so, so is it like you just didn't have a cost center? Now you have a cost center, and then now you got to recreate policies from scratch, finances from scratch. Exactly. The and, big bang. Yeah. And, you know, fortunately, we're a big academic center, and they had a series of um, courses that they put all new leaders through, you know, um, leadership courses. But unfortunately, those leadership courses were more targeted at how to be a good leader, how to handle HR situations, mm -hmm. all of that. It did not tell you how to build a budget. It did not tell you how to uh, allocate FTEs. It did not tell you how to write a business plan. It didn't tell you how to expand a business plan. It only told you how to do all those other things. But I thought, as a former frontline caregiver, I knew all I needed to know about being a department manager because I knew what all the frontline caregivers needed. They needed equipment, they needed staff, and they needed money. You know, um, so I thought that was all I needed to know at the time. 
Um, but there's a lot more to it. It's not like if you don't spend it this year, you got all that leftover money for next year. Uh, <laughs> it's not like that. It's not like your household finances. But, uh, you know, and I remember sitting in my very first admin meeting and, you know, there was me and probably five or six other managers and the admin person and we're sitting around a table and the administrator said something like, uh, how, how many of you are using Six Sigma and Lean to realize efficiencies in your department? And I'm like, oh God, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> and I'm like, well, maybe as a rookie manager, they'll just kind of pass over me. And fortunately they did, but I listened very carefully to what the other people were saying. And I realized how much I did not know. And there was a lot. So, so, so Kathy, like, what did that feel like? Oh you my know, god! You, you like like I've been I've been a manager. Jonathan's been a manager. Like we are so, like we always talk about this. The best respiratory therapist gets moved up the chain to the point where they are the crappiest manager. And finance is like your number one metric on if you're a good leader or not. So how? How did that feel? Like I would, I've been there. I got to be honest, Kathy. I've been there. I've been crapping my pants. I'm like, uh, please don't talk to me right now. Yeah. What was that like? Tell us more about it. Well, kind of you're sitting there and you're, you know, it, it's like high, you're like, you're having a panic attack or anxiety attack. You know, your heart's racing and like, uh, you know, cause to me, six Sigma, I thought that was some kind of Greek alphabet thing, you know? And I thought lean was all about doing more with less or something, maybe, um, you know, so it's like, you know, I just didn't even know how to answer that. And I, you know, I probably would have said, I'll have to get back to you on that. Uh, <laughs> but I did go home and do some homework. Um, and I read a little bit about it. And I decided that was really when I decided I, I got to get more education on this. But I did talk to my finance person, I became very good friends with my finance person. Um, so that I would at least be able to talk intelligently in a meeting about it. Because that was like, I, uh, there's one thing about me, I do not like to look stupid in front of other people. So <laughs> even if I have to fake it, I want to, I don't want to look stupid. Um, so I did become extremely good friends with our finance person. And she is actually still the same finance person that I had when I became a manager about Eh, 20 years ago. Um, and she's actually retiring at the end of the year. So I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to miss her. Uh, and, uh, but I did start to look for um, MBA programs at that time with a healthcare administration track. So I thought that was probably an important um, move, you know, so that I could understand not only finance, but understand how it related to the business of healthcare administration. So, 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 Kath, you, 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 JB, you and I have talked about this. You're like, you're like, oh crap, I'm in a place where this isn't me anymore. Yeah. Like, I could be a great respiratory therapist, but now I'm being asked to do things I don't need. Kathy, I think you probably did the most important thing. And I want you to give a shout out to your financial person. Like, creating a relationship with that person matters a lot we and we talk about relationships all the time it has nothing to do like it's great to go back to school don't get me wrong it's great but to have that friendship and to have that person where you trust so please kathy shout out to your your financial person and congratulations on the retirement yeah like deborah she was she was like my godson she really was she taught me all about how to read spreadsheets. She taught me how to read uh, financial statements. She taught me a lot of stuff. And without her and her team, I probably would have been lost way early on, mm -hmm. way early on. So she was she was awesome. And and I do. I, I can't wait for her to enjoy her retirement. And um, but I'm gonna miss her. And I I I hope her replacement is half as good as she was. Oh, oh, that's so sweet. That's yeah. so sweet. You know what I like about that story, though? And then I tell this to new uh, people in leadership is to go make friends with the leaders of the other departments and then learn from them. 
because essentially that is like college. You're learning the content from the content expert, right? And so you're the content expert for respiratory, which is fine for your department, but there's other things that come in. And so you can go to the finance, learn finance from them. Uh, and you're, the finance you learn from them is going to be better than anything you can learn in the school. Uh, you know, and then I would go um, materials, uh, how to, you know, manage materials. I learned from the management uh, or the directors of materials, uh, infection control, I'd go to the source, quality, I'd go to the source. And, and everything I learned from all the department heads in the hospital I felt was more impactful than anything I've learned from a book. And so the fact that you did it and we're, and we're so successful is just another testament to, you know, you should seek out the um, other leaders and not put yourself in a silo because you learn so much more and grow your department exponentially faster. Yeah. We learned a lot from each other though, because in our, in our environment, the finance people actually build our budgets annually um and the way they built their budgets uh sometimes didn't coincide with the real work that we did so they learned from us as well or at least you know deborah learned from me about how our work actually um was very seasonal sometimes very seasonal especially in pediatrics as you may know uh so she understood that what we did from June, from January to June was very different than what we did from July to December. Um, and usually we built our budgets in June. So Kathy, Ka Kathy, do you think that that relationship made your job as a leader a little easier? Oh my God, exponentially so. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think that's an important, like, that's an important piece that our listeners need to hear is that, Jonathan, just like you said, those relationships that you have can help you be more successful. Because if you don't know, it's so stressful. Like, my first job as a manager, like, I thought I knew finance. I went to school. I thought I got it. But what I didn't realize is that everybody around me had not had, knew nothing about respiratory therapy so I became a translator in a way it was uncomfortable to have a financial conversation because they have their mission and I have my mission and they weren't always aligning it was it was it was uncomfortable but uh but once I had those friends and I asked for help, like things changed. It, mm -hmm. it, it got a lot easier, a lot easier. Yeah. It's like having a passport and you're using it, right? You're going to all these different countries, learning all these new languages. And then you can just like put all the pieces together. It took me having to work with all these other departments to figure out how the hospital works, you know, in respiratory, I know how the respiratory department works, but once once you get out of there, it's a whole nother world that you don't know how it all works. And so getting your hands dirty, talking to people, having those relationships, that's really impactful um, as a leader. And you can start speaking these other languages like Kathy was mentioning that makes you grow, really. And if you don't use it, I mean, you, you're going to find that your department gets moved down to the basement because no one knows what you do and you're not a pivotal or impactful department within the whole. Right. So yeah, I, I, I like that story. Yeah. And do you guys mind explaining to, I've heard often um, respiratory is a cost center. Um, that is, is a cost. Do you mind explaining like why that is? Well, I in the early days, respiratory therapy was a revenue generator. You know, um, when insurance companies paid on a fee for service basis, you know, you performed a task, you charged a charge, and the hospital was reimbursed at some level for that task. But as in, as everything has evolved and the way that hospitals are paid has changed, now we cost the hospital money and our services are just kind of lumped into that pot of money that the hospital receives for various diagnosis 
And so if we do unnecessary services or unnecessary tasks, we can still bill for them and they might show up on our on our spreadsheet, but if that service didn't result in the patient getting discharged quicker or getting having a more positive outcome, it's simply a cost, the labor cost, the supply cost, everything else. So I think that's the problem there is then it becomes the employees, your frontline employees, they know they're performing tasks. They're performing a lot of tasks. They know that those tasks are generating bills and they think, oh, well, I'm doing all these tasks and I'm generating all this revenue. Um, why aren't I, why can't I have more equipment? Why can't I have higher wages? Why can't I have, you know, this and this and this? So they going the extra mile to explain to your staff that you are a cost center and not a revenue generator is really important so that they can um, buy into things like protocols, which will help get patients out of the ICU faster, out of the hospital faster, um, uh, and those kinds of things, and be more efficient in their care. So. Kind of like what we were talking about uh, earlier this week when we were uh, going over capital uh, budgets, right? And And then one of the questions that came up was, you know, what is the business case that you can make for new capital? For example, if you were in like the outpatient setting in the Bronx lab, right? And you're going to bring in a new procedure. So what you would do is you would look at how much is the reimbursement, right? And so then you know how much revenue you'd be getting, but then now you got to look at all the expenses. How, how much does it cost for the RT in the room, the disposables, the physician anesthesia and nursing and all that stuff. So it's the same principle here. You have a DRG, you have a do not exceed, you have a daily per diem. That's how much you're going to get reimbursed. Everything that goes into that is reducing that dollar amount. And so at some point, and oftentimes, a lot of the times, you'll the cost to, of, of care of that patient is going to exceed the amount that you got reimbursed. And so now you're you're starting to lose per patient. And that's where you need to be efficient. That's where you need to make sure that we're doing everything that we're doing is efficient, impactful, and the really on the inpatient side, the only way to make revenue is to decrease that length of stay. And then on the physician side, you got to make sure that they coded it correctly. Those are really the only two ways you're going to make money on an inpatient side. Um, so that's why everyone who is not a, a revenue generator is a cost center, right? And so that's really, now all you're looking at is everyone is is in the red column and they're just whittling away that reimbursement. So that's what we say, when we say cost center, that's kind of the view of it. Who paints that picture like that you can get the cost per patient? Is that the finance person? What do you mean paint the picture? Uh, who provides you the data? Oh, that well, you could get all that information to then, to then do I, that. I mean, you're not, I mean, you could get down to the patient level, but you're looking at like a, a bigger picture, um, you know, and, and really it's productivity. So you can look at your productivity and then how many procedures were performed, but then it's kind of difficult. I mean, Kathy, how do you do it? How do you weave into the bigger picture your the cost of the total department uh, versus uh, how much the hospital gets reimbursed? How how I mean, everyone does it a little bit differently, but I'd like to hear how you do it. Well, I mean, it really depends on your realization rates and your payer mix, and you know um, how much Medicare do you have, how much Medicaid do you have. So it really looks. It really depends on all of that. And it can change from month to month even. So what's a realization rate? It's it's like how much you get on on the dollar. So if your realization rate is, you know, 50%, that means you get 50 cents on the dollar of your charges. And then uh also define the uh, payer mix, because I don't think a lot of people understand that either. The payer mix will be how many um, payers do you get that are fee for service versus, um, you know, you know, like your DRG type payers where you get a flat fee for a diagnosis based on how it's coded and those kinds of things. So 
it'll all depend on what that payer mix is. If you're primary Medicare, Medicaid, you know, your payer mix is very restricted. Wow. Do you, Kathy, do you have an example of a time where you had to use your financial skills to um, either get a project or idea approved or to champion something like Butler kind of gave an example earlier, but um, yeah, I'm curious, like how you've championed something. I think most of those times, well, I mean, most of those times you, I think that most of the time that really, for me, most of the time it goes to FTE allocations. So we know how many um, RTs it takes to cover a shift um 24 7 and then I you know we tally we we actually track our workloads every single day and then we track them over time and we know how much it costs to have agency for instance versus overtime versus um flow pool people and things like that and so financially you know you can add all that stuff up you know, and this is how much it costs to have agency people here. This is how much it costs for overtime. This is how much it would cost. And then you can plug in those numbers that you've had over time in terms of workloads and how much a, a therapist can actually perform uh, and say, if you let me hire three more people, I can get these costs down by this much. Um, recently, they had to do that with showing that if I if they let me hire five more people, I could save them a hundred thousand dollars in just salary costs in a six month period of time. That's because when you hire these new FTEs, their their base rate is going to be lower than the premium rates of people working overtime and agency coming in. So that's really where you show like a six figure savings. Yes. Yeah. Even when you factor in the cost of benefits. Yeah. Because what's that, about 20%? Uh, yeah, how about that? 25. Oh, got that Cadillac uh, plan. Uh, it's, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's Cleveland. Cleveland rocks. That's how yeah. it works. That's yeah, what I've been told. Yeah, the Rock Hall of Fame, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Kathy, like, so I, I, I think that's where respiratory therapists sometimes feel devalued is over time we made money and now we don't and now we're an expense and 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 that just feels a little wrong but and we talked uh, you said the word value value is my favorite word of all time so how does the value of the respiratory therapists equate to finance how does it how do we get the most out of value for us our awesomeness and how do we equate it to dollars well i think you know we've heard a lot of buzzwords about value-based care lately um and that's i think that's really where we have to put our you know we have to put the, our marbles into that basket um you know i think there's a lot of evidence out there for us to kind of hang our hat on for value-based care Certainly in my world, in pediatrics, you know, there's there's lots of evidence that shows um, things like for bronchiolitis, for instance, we're about to embark on the, the viral season, the respiratory viral season right now. And things like not giving bronchodilator therapy to kids who have viral respiratory diseases. We shouldn't be doing that. We should not be wasting our time doing therapy that does not work. It doesn't contribute positively to their outcomes. So we should not be doing things like that. We should be doing things that the evidence shows that that does impact their care. Anything that we can, anything that we can do that positively impacts their care, that positively reduces the length of stay, those are the things that we should be doing. Um, we should be managing ventilators. We should be um, using protocols for asthma-based care, bronchiolitis-based care, other kind of bronchiolytic or uh, bronchodilator-based care, do it when it's necessary, wean it when it's necessary, 
making sure that our ventilator patients are getting sedation vacation, spontaneous breathing trials on a daily basis, extubation early, um, early excavation, all those things should be happening and they should be respiratory therapy driven. So I, I agree with this so much that driving quality is about reducing expense and, and, and it's, it's about efficiency. It's about those things, but let's say you want some fancy piece of equipment mm -hmm. say you want something that is because we're all about cutting costs because if we cut costs we increase our value right because that's what we're trying to do but what if you need to increase costs how do you do that okay well there i mean for instance not every increased cost is going to be worth the money A some will, absolutely some will not um, if you can increase costs and reduce care for the majority of your patients, it's going to be worth it. For instance, if you have a nebulizer that's going to deliver better particle size, more efficiently, and perhaps even eliminate some admissions from the emergency department or reduce the length of stay for some of your patients, that would be worth the cost. So if you did this, uh, you know, ventilators is one of our largest costs. Um, and so you, you'll see that. And like, when you're deciding on which ventilator to choose for your department, sure. you know, uh, some are, some are going to be more expensive than others. And so, you know, in the pediatric world and the neonate world, um, that comes into effect. I mean, did you do anything with that? We did. We um, were obviously a large hospital system and we standardized our ventilator platform, which gave us a lot of buying power. And for our hospitals that had just NICUs, they bought the neonatal platform only, which reduced the cost. Um, in our main campus where we have NICU, PICU, and, you know, we had to go with the universal model, which was an increased cost. But when we, for our hospitals that just had NICUs, we were able to scale down that ventilator that did everything we needed it to do and everything the universal model did, but in the neonatal only platform, which was about $10,000 per machine cheaper. I, I, it, it, that's interesting because... It, <laughs> I, I've bought way too many ventilators in my life, like way too many. And they're like, hey, we need the Cadillac. We can get away with a Ford Fiesta. I mean, and, and, and that's just, to be honest, that's just true. Like, I'm never going to touch a neonate. Why do I need neonatal mode? Or I am never going to touch this magical mode that nobody ever uses. Like, why am I paying for that? Like that, that, that's an important piece, but Hey, I feel that this certain mode, this certain technology is going to drive outcomes. Then maybe it's a different conversation. So how does that work? And, and, and JB, I, I know you're, you and I've talked about this like a lot. What is the cost benefit analysis? Well, one thing I was also going to mention is like, mm -hmm. you know, when you're looking at ventilators, it is a long term uh, capital mm -hmm. purchase, right? So you also want to know is like, okay, I might be an adult hospital now, but do we have plans that are like three to five years out where we are going to put a NICU in because we are going to expand our labor and delivery and we want to put NICU in so we don't have to transfer babies out now should i buy that mode now or should i wait in the future is it an upgrade you know these are considerations um but if if it wasn't an upgrade and it was like a mechanical feature you had to get at the purchase right so then do you how do you explain that you know there's a lot of stuff that goes into these um uh large ticket expenses right because you got to look at the future you got to know um what the hospital's plans are going forward. And this is also with budgeting, right? So, um, you know, if you're also going to hire those same five FTEs, is it that you also brought in a new thoracic surgeon and that thoracic surgeon's going to increase your ventilator volume, right? And then now 
well, I'm going to need these as well. So I'm also decreasing the cost of the labor, but I also need the increased labor because the hospital is expanding and the volume is going to go up. So that's another consideration as well. I don't, I don't know why I just got off on a tangent, but uh -huh. those are just things I was just thinking of. Is, uh, Kathy, is it difficult to standardize the device across the hospital? Like, it, is that something that you then had to champion to make that possible? And like, how difficult is doing that? Because that gave you so much power in the negotiations. Um, it wasn't an easy task because there was an evaluation that went across several hospital systems, you know, of our of our hospitals. Um, so of course, not everybody was going to 100% agree, but I think in the end, everybody is pretty happy with the choices um, and it did make it pretty easy. And the other thing is, you know, they have available where you can get the software on every single machine if you want to, and then have modules that plug in so that you can have features on any machine that you want and it's kind of like a plug and play. So it made it pretty universal no matter where you went. Um, and the fact that we have individual RTs that float from facility to facility, we have a large float pool, that also made it really, really easy for those people to float from location to location because the equipment is standardized. So from an educational standpoint, it makes a lot of sense too. What what were the risks involved and how did you mitigate them? In terms of standardizing the equipment? Mm -hmm. Um it, it took a long time because there's a lot of pieces, a lot of ventilators over our system. So it, you know, there was an educational piece for those places that had to change. So people didn't, you know, people don't like change. Nobody likes change. Yeah. <laughs> um you know, people, I, I, I often talk to our, our fellows and our residents and I, I say, don't fall in love with the equipment that we have, because when you go someplace else, it's going to be different and you're never going to be able to dictate what they, what, what they have, you know, um, you don't get to, you don't get to have what you love because that's going to be determined by somebody else. Um, so just learn to learn the, you know, learn the, uh, the mechanics of ventilation and don't learn the ventilator itself. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that was probably the biggest challenge that we had was just getting people to buy in, you know, once we made the decision. And I, I'm assuming that there was some type of orientation process. And then, uh, I'm also assuming the competencies don't cross over from hospital to hospital. So do you just treat them like a, a new hire, um, employee that you have part-time or how does that work? You mean the float people? Yeah. Actually, we have an enterprise educator that does the competencies across the uh, across the enterprise. Oh, wow. oh, that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's, a, that's unheard of. Yeah. Wow, <laughs> wow, that's so cool. Yeah. Wow. Well, you know, we rock. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy, um, we're coming up to that half hour mark. Uh, I was wondering. Uh, to kind of close this out as some final last questions is, um, so I'm like a, let's say I'm a new RT or new uh, a director. Uh, what financial tips might you have to either learn more, to get the mentor that you have? Um, and, and, you know, it sounds like too, like going, getting your MBA was a good decision for you. Um, but yeah, what, what tips would you give someone who who's trying to develop their financial skills? Um, let's see. You know, I do think if if you can buddy up with another manager that you really have um, a lot of um, admiration for, that would be great. And it doesn't have to be a respiratory therapy manager. It can be somebody in another department who you just know makes good decisions um, would be probably the best advice I could give you. And then that financial person would be really also an, another really good choice. Yeah. Yeah. No, those are two good ones. And we've seen you do that, right? You yeah. networked yourself and then you went and found more resources. Um, so no, great tips. Jonathan, Matt, as uh, directors, any tips? Oh, uh, well, before I just had another question. Um, 
So part of your succession planning, I'm assuming you have someone that you kind of mentor that's coming up behind you. Um, what was it like going and, and explaining that healthcare is a business? Because when you're coming from clinical into leadership, you, your mind has to flip over that this isn't a business. And so what, what is that conversation like and how receptive were they? Um, when I was explaining it to whom, it depends on my audience. And, and, any, anyone in your department, um, you know, any of your clinical staff that you think might move up or they have, um, you know, plans to move up into yeah. management? Like, the, how do the, you have that conversation? The clinical staff matters, right, Jamie? Yeah. The yeah. clinical staff, because like we all provide value. We're all awesome respiratory therapists, but that finance piece is a little missing. So spot on. Yeah. So I, I actually do have this conversation with my frontline caregivers and, you know, cause they do often, you know, they're working hard every day. And especially now with this healthcare shortage that we have, and I do, you know, they, you know, sometimes out of their mouth, the first thing you hear is, oh my God, we're working so hard. We're, you know, doing so much and we, you know, we should get a raise. We should this, we should, and I agree with them. They, sh you know, they deserve every single thing we can get for them. And we do, we work hard to get them raises and bonuses and all of that every single day. Um, but I do, you know, I said, you know, at the end of the day, um, healthcare, like anything else, is a business. And in order for us to get you more, we have to make sure that this hospital is making money so that we can ask for more. And so then I do explain this whole kind of um, third party payer and, and the realization rates and, and some of that so that they understand that just because we charge a, you know, $2,000 a day for a ventilator or whatever the charge is, you know, I'm just throwing that out there. I don't know what it is right off the top of my head, but just because we charge that much doesn't mean that that's how much we get paid from the insurance company. Um, so that they understand that, you know, concept of, of what is reimbursed. And Kathy, to be honest, you're a children's hospital, so you still have a little bit of fee for service yes. on the adult on the adult side. Mm -hmm. It's all DRG based, right? Right. So, well, oh, we dropped a charge. That charge means nothing. it means right. it means nothing. Exactly. So, like, it, it, and and I think when respiratory therapists understand when I drive quality, I'm going to lower costs lower consequences and i can really drive results and that's what we're about that's where you get respiratory therapy oh, oh i got this idea i got this i got this that's really how you engage respiratory therapists but if you're like oh hey you didn't drop enough charges today i'm like uh, i don't care <laughs> you know you, you know matt you you really hit the nail on the head with that you know because if you're if you're talking about burnout I can easily get burned out by giving 42 nebulizer treatments a shift and, you know, feeling like a trained monkey can replace me. But now you're going to say, hey, we want to decrease the length of stay. Hey, we want to do things that only impact the outcomes of these patients. Now you're you're touching the brains of the RTs and you're actually telling them, we want you to use the things that you learned in respiratory school instead of coming in and being a drone, you know, and, and then you might even see that your, your burnout rate goes down mm -hmm. because now they're, they're functioning at a different level instead of just coming in and, you know, they could be blindfolded and give treatments and, you know, everything would still be okay. But now you're going to want to say, Hey, I want you to think, I want you to use your head and use what you learned in school. And let's help these patients better than we ever have in the history of our profession. And I think that the burnout rates would drop. Yeah. And I think that's where the importance of the RT driven protocols are really going to help. Agreed. So Lawrence Reynolds, our bar fly right now, Sh shook his head we've been waiting for him to shake his head he agreed with that now we know we won we won he agrees with that lawrence thank you so much for joining us but like that but that, but that's what it's about like doing the right thing yeah like just do the right thing 
and stop worrying about this. You usually, uh, 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 no offense to whoever made doing it, but like re- literally, if I never give, <laughs> like I went back to school to never give a doing them again. I, I'll be honest, but like that's what it's about when it comes to finance of what we're actually doing. It's about the value of the RT, and if you can optimize the value of RT, finance isn't even a conversation anymore. Yeah. It's just not. It's just not. So that's it's so exciting. I love it. JB, good call. Lawrence, thank you for shaking your head. You made me feel better. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Anna. All right. Awesome. Sorry, you guys. That was a really good conversation. Um, and Butler, uh, uh, super insightful too on burnout rates and comparing that to uh, this financial combo uh, J- so- J- J- jb you're spot on why i went back to school is because i never wanted to give a do and ev again to somebody who didn't need it and imagine all the do and evs that just hurt our soul every time we get <laughs> and i didn't want to look stupid <laughs> like 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 seriously it hurts our soul as a as a profession but it also is a gigantic cost that we're not getting reimbursed with. So all it does is make us look foolish. So uh, when we talk about financial acumen, it, it, it should be ha- no offense to whoever makes doing them because, <laughs> because it, it does matter. But hashtag never give bad doing them. Like that's a, that's a great hashtag. Because, like, when we talk about finance, this is it. So that's so cool. Yeah, I mean, just to save you, but Duoneb <laughs> is is a meaningful drug. But it's it's, yeah. it's meaningful when it works. You don't want to give it to a CHF patient. Uh, you know, you don't want to give it to an RSV patient. You know, you want to give it where it's an asthmatic that needs it. But, again, it took you as a uh, licensed professional to understand where is this drug going to be most impactful and you give it instead of just being forced to do something repeatedly over and over again. You know, I, I read this interesting thing on uh, ADHD and it says, no, no, no. It, it, uh, I'll, I'll link the two. I'll link the two together. Don't worry about it. But really what it That's was awesome. saying was, is that like it starts in elementary school when these kids have all this energy and you force them to sit there and not move in their chairs, right? So you can't physically move. What do you do? You mentally check out, right? So same thing in our profession. If you're giving handheld nebulizers over and over and over again, you don't even know why you're doing it. Guess who's mentally checking out? You got to do it because this is your job, right? But why am I doing this? They just tell me I have to do it. So you mentally check out. You just You're just out, right? But now let's bring everyone back. Let's start letting them have that energy that they, they were born with and just have in them and put it to good use, right? Let's bring everyone back. And I, I, I think we, with the respiratory driven protocols that Kathy's using is the way to do it. No, I, I agree, Kathy, like, well, you're Cleveland clinic, so we all just look up to you, but like, you're doing the right stuff, doing the right stuff. It's financially advantageous. <laughs> like it's literally that simple. Like this is not hard. This is not hard at all. It really so, is. Kathy, thank you so much. This was awesome. JB, as always, between two eucalyptuses. <laughs> <laughs> we just kind of giggle. So uh awesome podcast. Well done, guys. So I, if you want to continue learning more, um, Kathy too, we're going to have a plug for you next week. Uh, we have a webinar with uh, Katie Burr and uh, Gary Kaufman on eliminating non-value added work that I think directly correlates to this. So that one you actually get a CEU credit for this. Again, RT sidebar, you do not get CEU credits for, but uh, I'll put a link in the show notes so you could register so you can keep learning um and keep this conversation going uh kathy really thank you again this was so awesome to hear from you and we're going to offer more um ceus we have another one uh at the end of the month too so super exciting uh any last thoughts kathy no this was great um i you know i mean you could probably talk about 
making the right financial decisions for a long, long time, you know, for mm -hmm. hours, like, you know, how do you predict what you're going to need for a whole year or for the five-year projected outlook? Because, you know, like you said, you know, what if you're going to expand? What if you're not, you know, those kind of things, but, you know, it's anybody's guess sometimes, but yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And then a pandemic occurs and a recall. And so, oh. I mean, so much of our two is bringing people together to have these conversations so that they can network and maybe that RT doesn't have a good financial source. And so now they can reach out to you um, ho oh, if, if you don't mind or us, whatever. Anyway, anyone can reach out. We'd love to hear from them. So, um, and connect and problem solve together. Uh, I do want to jump into some shout outs if that's okay. So we have a link in the show notes as well. So you can give a shout out to someone, uh, whether that's a promotion, graduation, anniversary, or just say hey, a good job, recognize them. Um, we love to celebrate the profession and it is Restory Care Month. And so we love to give shout outs, but we do this all the time. So look in the show notes, there's going to be a form right there and fill that out. So Matt, do you want to kick it off with our first shout out? I would love to. Thank you so much, Anna Haynes. Appreciate it. First off, shout out to Kathy Fedor. Thank you so much for, for being here with us today. Lawrence Reynolds for shaking his head makes my <laughs> makes me happy. Thank you so much. Linda Corman is my one of my best friends. She's on today. Joe Garcia as always. But happy retirement retirement to Carol Ballant from Rogers, Arkansas. We love you. Happy retirement. Thank you for all that you've done. JB to you. All right. So we have a happy promotion to Vanessa Harrell in Arlington, Texas. Vanessa was nearly 20 years of experience in a as a respiratory therapist. She was director of respiratory at San Joaquin Valley College in Bakersfield, California, which is just north of where I used to live. Uh, she returned to bedside in 2020 to help with the pandemic. She agreed to be a supervisor or take a supervisor position at Medical City Arlington and quickly rose to manager and recently became director of respiratory. She is still climbing the ladder and taking more leadership roles in her hospital. All of her staff love her, and she consistently meets her goals and exceeds them. And yes. So a barfly submitted that. Uh, so yeah, uh, you were well loved, Vanessa. Um, to all the <laughs> RTs, happy respiratory care month. That's from Ashley Metzner. So Merit Health Central Respiratory Therapy Department. Good job team from Mary Rucker. A great group of people to work with. Mary Rucker celebrates her team. Thank you so much, Mary. And uh, to Angel Bostick over in Houston, Texas, congrats on the promotion from Kareem. He said you're incredible, kind, and big on patient at and being big on a patient advocate. And happy birthday to Tammy Bailey over in North Carolina. Who doesn't love somebody from North Carolina? Because I <laughs> might have been there for a smidge second but happy anniversary to Keisha Holtzman from Richland PA I hope it's the same Richland that I'm from that my wife is from but we hope all respiratory therapists come from Richland so Keisha Holtzman thank you so much and Kathy do you have a shout out yep I want to well I'd really like to shout out to Anna Jonathan and Matt for oh. Oh. doing this Thank and you. Lori Tinkler, who's the CEO of the MBRC, for suggesting that Lori, I Lori is the best person ever on yeah. the planet. And I'd like to shout out to my Cleveland Clinic Children's Respiratory Therapy team because they're totally awesome. That's awesome. All right. Well, thank you, Kathy. Thank you, everybody. And we will see you next time. does not practice medicine or provide medical <laughs> services or advice. Any clinical recommendations provided herein are solely those of the speaker. Practitioners should refer to the full indications for use and operating instructions of any products referenced before use. Published Cone Hayes are employees of Babytherm Butler as a paid consultant and our guest is not compensated. <laughs>